In today's webinar, we're going to talk about all things special needs trusts. We're going to dig deep into what is a special needs trust? How do you go about using one? Why would you use one? Do you need a special needs trust in addition to an ABLE account? Or can you use one or the other sort of interchangeably? We're going to talk about how to fund special needs trusts, how to not fund special needs trusts. Um, we're going to talk about first party, third party special needs trusts. We're going to talk about pooled special needs trusts all things special needs trust. And with that, we will turn to our resident expert. My name is Keith Caldwell. I am a parent just like most of you guys out there. Um, and I am learning and listening from Ryan as well because I have a lot of questions myself as I plan for the future when I'm gone. So with that, uh, I'll let Ryan go ahead and introduce himself. Yeah, I mean, that list from Keith, I'm tired myself just thinking about it. Holy mackerel. But um, but I appreciate everybody sending your questions in. Um, you know, if, if this is the first time uh, that you're coming uh, to this webinar, thank you so much. Uh, Keith and I have been uh, blessed to uh, be doing those these for folks since I believe 2013, Keith, if I remember correctly. So we've it's been a we, we've gone through we've gone through quite a number of iterations uh, and we've stumbled on doing some of these question and answer sessions. Uh, because, you know, we want to make sure we're answering questions that, that you guys have. Okay, Ryan, and I see you guys' questions coming in. I'm going to get to them, and I'm going to get to some of the questions that we had from um, people who've already submitted in. But what I wanted to share with you, Ryan, and I did look, get preface it was not a good thing. And the reason I've been sort of gone for the last couple months is I experienced yet another loss, probably my best friend over the last 20, 25 years, and who was my number one person after my death, who was going to take over my kids, who's in my special needs trust and on and on and on, very entwined, part of my letter of intent, all of it died unexpectedly in May. Totally oh. did not see that coming. And one, I was very, very depressed as a result of it. I just couldn't focus on anything other than that. But I bring it all here because it's applicable for all of us. And the reason it's applicable for all of us is you just never know, right? And now I have to revise my special needs trust. I have to revise my letter of intent. I have to think about that because now my son is the number one. And I don't think it's fair for a 21 year old to take, if something happened to me tomorrow, to be the primary person on my side. So I need to find another adult to squeeze in there between him and that. So my situation got super complicated. So one of the questions I want to ask you is, and when those kinds of circumstances occur, what kinds of things should we be looking at we might need to change? That's question number one. And the other thing I'm putting out to the rest of the families out there, because it also got me thinking about, I'm here to deal with this loss. And it was a very painful loss. But what if the next caregiver has to experience the same kind of thing? Are we going to leave him or her the proper instructions of how to deal with that, what the little nuances are. Because I realize that 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 I'm aware, I'm here, I know what the nuances are of planning, at least to what I've learned from Ryan, but what if my next caregiver is taking over me and they experience their next person? I know it's getting a little complicated, but I want you guys to sort of think through that because we have to, to fill in the gap in our own thinking about how things play out as best we can. I mean, we can't be perfect, but as best we can to sort of think through how these kinds of unforeseen things, because she was in her 40s and I totally wasn't expecting that to happen, um, but it did. And it happens to some of us out there all the time. And I want you guys to not be blindsided like I was, but to learn from my situation and how I deal with it because I know that I need to change these things because she's no longer there to provide that service. So that's what I've been going through. And that's why I've been sort of gone for the last couple of months, because I just, I said, as of July one, I'm going to get my head back in the game and I'm ready to start getting to work. But the last couple of months, I just, I was running around being a nomad because she was my best friend for literally the last 25 years. So that Ryan is the not so good news I wanted to share with you, but I wanted to make it applicable for others as well. So qu first question is, can you give me like a laundry list, just not what to do, but what things as a result of this unexpected death should I be looking at possibly changing? I identified a special needs trust. I identified my letter of intent. Was there something else I should be concerned with or thinking through? 
I'm so sorry, man. Thanks, Ryan. It stinks. The um, I am sorry for her family as well. The uh, single mom with a 11 year old daughter. So just as it's heartbreaking. Yeah. The uh, I mean, I think, uh, it, you know, you're thinking of the right thing, right? When when somebody passes away or also, you know, is not available anymore, right? Maybe they move to a different country mm -hmm. and it's just not going to be functional for them. Um, you know, that that's why it is important to, you know, go back at, and review all these documents to make sure that the same people are still the same people, um, uh, you know, to be able to handle these jobs. I, I think you're right. Um, you want to go back and, you know, think through the, the folks in the special needs trust and, and adjust who that is. Um, uh, you know, certainly the letter of intent as well. Um, and that's, you know, to me, Keith, this, this, uh, and sometimes I know it sounds self-serving when I say it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, don't do this stuff on your own. I mean, find an organization that focuses on this stuff and get a relationship and be a partner with them. I mean, you know, it just, you know, just last month, Keith, I had a similar situation. I mean, I was a family I've worked with for years and years and years. I was in the hospice room, right, with them four weeks ago. I mean, he's, you know, the dad's 67 years old. Right. He's, as I continue to age, that's not very old. You know, not, not 40, right. right, but but diagnosed with cancer in December and in hospice within June, right? And, and, and it, I feel like it, you really want – professionals in your corner who know you, know your family, right. and can take some of that responsibility to make sure things are done right. and, and to make sure that you get them done. Because we all have good intentions, but then it just kind of, everything gets overwhelming, right? No, we haven't done this before. I mean, I know Keith and I, and, and this is no offense to anybody, Keith and I were, and this is why we do these webinars. We love answering these questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keith and I were we're kind of just kind of chatting before we started. And we're like, yeah, did you review the questions? Yeah, yeah, I reviewed the questions. I said, did they seem similar to other webinars we've done? Keith was like, yeah, they're about the same. They're, they're always the same questions. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's okay, because that's what we're here to answer. Um, but what I want to make sure is that families, you get the answers to your questions, but that then you figure out how to use those answers. Right. And that's the hard part. I mean, I can give you generalized answers here, but that doesn't do you. I mean, yeah, it gives you some information, mm -hmm. but it doesn't help your plan. Right. right? I mean, it, what I just said was you, you need to figure out what those cost projections are. And a lot of people say it's impossible. Well, it's not because that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So I know it's not. And we get pretty darn close because we've had 16 years of experience and track record of doing that for countless families. And now we know because they're dying. And we know what the numbers need to be. And that's what I'm talking about. Those are the kind of relationships you want. You know, if, if you know what the problem is, there's a solution out there. Right. If you know you have a heart issue. Yeah, go to a webinar and learn about it. But eventually call the cardiologist and go make an appointment. I mean, right. I mean, it, Again, because these things happen and then and then like you said, Keith, I mean, yeah, and we've talked about this before, too, is as you do this planning, you want to have meetings like literally facilitated meetings with all those people. Right. So so now, Keith, your circle just got smaller. True. Right. Because one of those people that would be in those meetings isn't anymore. So now your meetings are going to be you, your son, you talked about your niece, your ex, mm -hmm. and literally those are the meetings that families should have. Is that hard for families to organize? Yes. 
Is it hard for somebody to me, for somebody like me to organize and make the family do it? No. Because it's a third party. It's always easier for a third party to walk in and say, hey, this is the meeting we're going to have. Here's the agenda. Come with your questions about your family's plan and what everybody's responsibility is. It just is. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just the way because families have dynamics. <laughs> all, right? I mean, all true. of us do. Right. And all of ours do. Um, I mean, shoot. That's why I've been to a therapist before. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they know what to do. Right. Our, my family's been to one. <laughs> they know what to do. Right. It's just the again. Experts. Well, yeah. And, and they can help guide, you know, kind of that process and that exploration to kind of uncover those layers of maybe people or organizations. Right. That may be able to be down the line in terms of a trustee. Right. As we as as we lose people, maybe there is an organization that that you want to have as part of that trustee lineup. So that if your loved one with a disability outlives everybody, there's at least a final, you know, stop loss of an organization um, that would be able to step in. Um, and 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 that's part of what that family would decide. All right, Ryan, we're going to go ahead and take some questions because I, I and we you and I can talk offline, but I just wanted to share what, that with you yeah. and with you out there, because some of you might be experiencing the same thing. Some of you might be about to experience mm -hmm. the same things and your future caregivers may experience those same things. So we need to, while we're here, be thinking through the instructions we would give the next caregiver that if this happens, these are the kinds of things that you should be looking to do. How you communicate that could be in your letter of intent. It could be video instructions. It could be any combination of the above. But I didn't even think about that aspect of it until it hit me. And I realized that I need to prepare my next generation for that potentiality as well. All right. Okay. So let me grab a couple questions here. I got my iPad because I can't do two things at once. Um, so I need line four. Wait, these are not done in lines. All right. Your greatest, your greatest, your greatest uh, plans always come forward. So let's go from here. So if we must hire a professional trustee, uh, oh, let me go. I'm leaving my house to my, I'm leaving my house to my special needs grandson. Can the trust pay for taxes, insurance, and utilities? I, I remember that one. That, that is great. So, so just as the, as the question reads, Right. I'm leaving my house to my grandson with a disability. Well, if you leave it directly to your grandson's name. So, you know, Jack Brown actually owns the house. Then a special needs trust cannot cannot pay for the expenses of the home. Right. It can't do that. Um, what can pay for it is any of the government benefits, because one of the one of the rules still with a special needs trust is not supposed to pay for kind of rent or utilities, um, but but and really not supposed to pay for grocery store. Right. That's what the government benefits are supposed to pay for. Um, but the workaround to that is instead of just having your grandson own it you know, have the have your grandson's special needs trust own the home. And then and and if that's your plan, you also will want to have some liquid assets inside the special needs trust so that it can pay for some of those expenses. The other thing that you would also do in that respect, if that's the way you design it, is you would more than likely set up some type of rental agreement um, with your grandson so that a portion of his government benefit income can then be deposited into the special needs trust. So the special needs trust would be the landlord because it owns the house. It'll get rent from your grandson 
to help pay the bills of the house. But there's always got to be a liquid fund. And Keith knows this because he, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't probably say his personal business, but Keith is a real estate guy. Mm -hmm. So he has real estate and he knows stuff happens with real estate state that needs to get paid. And you need liquid money to be able to do that, right? You need liquid money to maintain a piece of property. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I always suggest. If you're going to own a home that your uh, child or grandchild with a disability is going to live in, you know, own it with the trust, you know, let the trust own it, have another account owned by the trust that's actually money, uh, liquid money, and then probably set up some type of rental agreement um, between the trust that owns the home and uh, the adult with the disability.